Hello and welcome to Simply Technical. We're back again here on this lovely Monday. Uh, Dave's episode actually just released this morning, so that's kind of exciting. Um, get to talk about the NFL health and concussions and DeMar Hamlin. Yeah, yeah, which seems to be quite in the news right now. <laughs> the the and, conspiracy. Yeah. Have you, have you seen that? That oh, they don't no. think he, that, that they don't think he was at the actually at the game. Because it was a guy who had his face covered or whatever. Huh. It's kind of funny. It. It. I mean, it's dumb, but it's a. It's a little bit of a rabbit hole. Yeah. Um. Evan joined with Keaton again. Um. We're we're here to record, and we got a kind of a slew of uh, topics here, but uh, we kind of want to start off with the video. I know we've done some sharing some screens before, but we have a video. Um. I guess to give a little background, he's it's a Sebastian guy. He's a YouTuber, um, and he's making fun of people in their twenties for not being super rich. I guess I don't. We can not just watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not having a Lamborghini. Um, <laughs> let's let's watch it and uh, we can digest it together. I realize now that it's so incredibly easy, and there's so much money out there. And 200 grand relative to what is out there in circulation and what you can grab, especially now with AI tools that you can leverage like never before, 200 grand is Trump change. If you're a guy in your 20s and you don't have a Lamborghini, you should actually sit down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I still, got, I still got three more years. Like, yeah, maybe I'm just insecure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that I don't own a Lamborghini yet. The, uh, I mean, he's. So what, the main point that stuck out is, two hundred thousand dollars is not a lot for what's out in circulation right now. Is is a quote from the, that video right there. I mean, he's not wrong. Like you're right. There's trillions of dollars in circulation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're not wrong. Two thousand two hundred thousand dollars is not much to you know compared to trillions. But like, for the median income or the average income in the united states is what thirty five thousand, fifty thousand. like oh is it really that low like yeah so like, i could see i, I could see fifty thousand, but thirty five thousand. yeah it's in that range there um i guess it depends on probably where you you pull from um yeah but i mean yeah less less than fifty five thousand dollars a year i mean if you saved your if you made fifty thousand dollars a year what four years of your entire if you didn't spend a dime on anything then you four the, you have a lamborghini congratulations you just drove it off a lot now it's worth 150 <laughs> good job you just wasted fifty thousand dollars so um what, what do you think about the video i don't know i i mean i have no idea who this guy is whatsoever so i could just be completely speaking out of turn right now but it's like this is a type of like person seems that would have you know multi-millionaire parents who basically funded all their <laughs> business aspirations it's kind of what the stereotype is so that's like my automatic assumption i don't know if that's necessarily true but it's quite ridiculous and it like follows with this whole like meme of the tiktok investors account have you ever seen that on twitter oh i've seen a little bit of, on tiktok yeah yeah of like yeah there's the always stay co compounding guy which is like okay well that makes sense but how often are we actually comp like compounding continuously? Oh no, I'm talking. Yeah, I'm talking about the. I guess I don't know about that one, but in particular, but the Twitter account that will post like dumb TikTok investor, like especially it was like extremely oh. rampant in 2020 and 2021 when all these kids were making thousands of dollars on Robinhood, over leveraging, and just because the market was you know it's ridiculous back so then violent, i mean i yeah. i thought i was a genius investor back then and i i, I really thought that i had a career in finance because it was i was making i mean it wasn't like i made a ton of money but relative to my uh the money I put in, I was, yeah. yeah i was put, getting like 20 30 percent returns easily on every stock uh so i was like man i'm i'm actually really good at this I was like, turn, turns out it was just a massive bull market that was completely irrational. And uh, yeah, now I got humbled quite a bit. So <laughs> so, so he kind of reminds me of those TikTok investors. But I don't know. I mean, what do you think about these type of... Uh, I, th I think he's just making ridiculous statements to try to stay um, 
I don't know, stay relevant might not be the right term because he's, yeah. I mean, I looked at his channel. He has like 800,000 subscribers on YouTube, which, I mean, compared to us, you know, that's less than, less than 100 than us. is a lot. <laughs> um, he's also been grinding since I think it was 2014, I think. So um, he's been going at it hard, but it does remind me, I mean, this is a little bit off topic, I guess, but it reminds me a little bit of Andrew Tate. Um, what color is your Bugatti? Like, you're yeah. rich and successful, and yeah. your only comeback to somebody is, what color is your supercar, or why don't you have a supercar? Like, yeah, it's, it's lame. It's really lame. Especially, I mean, I don't know. It, to, I guess to most people, money is money, so however you make money, that's cool and all. And I think, I think it's cool. I mean, I think... It's impressive when anyone makes money on their own, but I think there's degrees of that. Like, how did you make your money? Did you like invent something or did you make money by being a clickbait master and selling some course on how to drop ship whenever you actually did never make any profit drop shipping? You actually made all your money from selling the course on how to make money drop shipping. <laughs> I think we kind of talked about this in the last episode or a couple episodes ago. We also talked about it back in, you know, 2019. No, yeah, like drop shipping a little bit, and how even then it was saturated. Yeah, um, I don't know if you can still do it on Amazon, but you can go to like people's stores, and you can see all the things that they have listed, and it's like ridiculous amounts of things, and it's just like the randomest things. Yeah, and it's like, oh, this person's selling laundry detergent and coat hangers and um, <laughs> and bars of so like just random things, and they might have some items they get from you know drop shipping from China. But it's yeah, it's just so saturated. But yeah, it's so saturated that they can't squeeze any profit out. They'll squeeze like what one percent margins, and then what they actually they show they show their revenue. Like you'll see it in every single video. They show oh, I made seventy thousand dollars last month. It's all revenue. It's not profit. But then they have oh, you want to see how to make? You want to see how much to make seventy thousand dollars a month? Here's my course. That's a thousand dollars, and. Okay, if you're making seventy thousand dollars a month, why do you need to make a course? <laughs> doesn't, doesn't for the people, sense. for the people. <laughs> yeah, you waste your time. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's hard to make money on just like hard to be rich, like like super rich, just offering a service. Um, like you don't see unless you're a man that owns, or a, I say man, a person that owns multiple like service industries. Like you might own a HVAC company and, you know, um, you know, maybe a restaurant, you know, multiple different things service wise. Um, but most people that are in the service industry like that, they only have their one business. Yeah. Um, so like people like this that are selling courses or selling um, this dream of owning a Lamborghini when you're in your 20s. Um, it's not practical for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I actually you put it the perfect way. They're selling the dream. That's I mean, that's where the whole like this whole field of contents sprung out of. They're they're just dream sellers. They don't really build anything. But you know, whatever. More I guess more power to them, but try it's obnoxious to see everyone people acting like this way. Yeah, everyone trying to do it or or people acting like this way. Or I mean honestly, this kid probably thinks he's like like an absolute genius whenever I, he probably just got a little bit lucky, worked hard, got a little bit lucky and struck a gold mine of, of, uh, pretty basic hitting it, hitting videos. That right algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. So I did watch, I did watch one of his videos, um, just in preparation for today. And one of the things I thought was pretty interesting was he was talking about using AI, like leveraging AI to build your business or, um, using AI to uh, the main thing he was selling was using AI to manipulate the stock market. Um, and it was about a, like an eight minute segment and six minutes of it was, well, you can use, you can use AI and you know, it's, it's cool and it can do all these things. Okay. Here's, here's a two minutes of chat uh, GPT writing software for you to sell stock when it's low and uh, or sell stock when it's high and buy stock when it's low for Bitcoin. It's like, okay, well, 
that's cool, I guess. I don't know. The absolute cool. most basic function that every single trading platform has, you know, to uh, stop limits and <laughs> yeah, limit buys and limit sells. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess it's cool that it can do it for you, but. I mean, if you're actually going to be serious in buying whatever Bitcoin or stock or something like that, like you should be able to put in the the 10 minutes a day to put those limits on. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I mean, I also just got what that video probably had like what 2 million views on it. Just like a really basic, obvious. Uh, yeah, it was like a 20 minute. It's like the whole thing was 20 minutes and it had other things about AI and how AI is going to steal your job. Um, and like we talked about in the first episode, it was the first episode, like we all thought it was going to steal the truckers jobs, but it stole the coders jobs. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it was a little bit of that in there. Yeah. Yeah. But even that, I mean, it gets 2 million views for something that's just like basic answer that can be copy and pasted by a thousand articles and, or a thousand other people's videos. It's not like anything really creative. Like here's how to use AI for your business. Uh, you use chat gpt to tell you give you some content and then you make put that content out like that's obvious who's who's giving the the unobvious ideas uh i mean i don't if if i had them i would be keeping them secret because i'm actually i would actually be wanting to start a business <laughs> um well and it, yeah to your point it's like so surface level like, yeah surface level. yeah anyone anyone like you're saying can can write they have a basic question of how can I use chat GPT to help me with my stocks? Oh, well, here's instructions, you know? Um, and I'm sure there's hundreds of other things like that, that are surface level. And he doesn't obviously dive into them, but I'm sure multiple people just like him are doing the exact same thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and speaking of chat GPT, uh, some news came out recently about it, right? They passed, did they pass some tests? Yeah, yeah. They well, <laughs> the uh, someone showed that it could pass the Wharton MBA bus business school test, which I don't really know what that involves. <laughs> I guess the Wharton school is pretty impressive, but it also showed that it could uh, uh, pass the U.S. medical licensing exam. You know, when you give the the uh, ChatGPT the input of in all the all of the multiple choice answers it will get them right or it will be able to pass that exam and actually before this this stuff came out i actually did it did it messing around because I, I did think about trying to build like a a audit uh ai which kind of just gave up on because i don't really understand audit at all and I, I was like i wonder if it could pass the cpa so i got like 10 questions and it got 100 percent on those <laughs> 10 questions which i thought was really cool and now that now it'll be like revalidated by this other stuff is pretty awesome but there's a lot of people that are kind of i guess you know hating on it and saying that that this is not impressive which no does does it being able to pass the u.s medical licensing exam mean that it can it's going to replace doctors no not at all <laughs> it just it just is a faster way to access information for doctors is how i see it and it is it is pretty impressive that it that it is able to do that i mean uh it it just goes to show that that the medical corpus of knowledge is is even more readily available at all of our fingertips and I, it's just going to keep getting better with the, each uh, iteration I, you kind of you brought it up before. So, what did you think about this uh, uh, Warden's business school story? Um, so, I'll give an example of a couple of questions that I looked up just here while you're talking. Um, questions is you know which of the following could be used as a pillar for an individual's leadership competencies? You know, three hundred and sixty degree feedback, leadership skill training. Systematic process learning, action learning, like these kind of sound like pretty, I wouldn't say basic, but I mean, you take a, you know, a three hour course, you might want to pass this test. At least, like I said, these yeah. are just sample questions. So, um, but th they don't seem all that difficult. And I mean, you can just Google them. So it seems yeah. like the AI is like, hey, I'm just a student that knows how to Google. Um, I think yes. it's impressive that it could go through, like, obviously it's automatic, it, you know. Um, you type in the question, it can search it and answer. 
I don't know if it's really all that much different than Google in that aspect. I, Here's how it's different than Google. It's a me. You don't have to spend the time looking for the right answer. And a lot of times you, well, we all cheated and I not cheated on tests in college, but everyone cheated on homework and was looking up questions and answers on Google. And probably 75% of the time you weren't going to find, you weren't going to find the question on Google. You find some derivative of the question and then you <laughs> figure it out from that or some der derivation of the question and figure it out from that. Um, but this, you can directly ask it the question and it will answer it. And I think you could make your own. Here's where the real test is. Can you make make your own questions that are legitimate questions with right answers and would it be able to answer it correctly is, is kind of the ultimate test. And I think with the US medical licensing exam, it's kind of like that. Those tests change uh, consistently. It's not like there's a test bank of 60 questions that that the AI was was trained perfectly on and knows exactly those 60 questions and so if you if it is asked that the, or if it's not asked one of those and it's not going to get it right uh, i don't think that's how how this works so yeah. it's it's a really it's a faster google and it's more uh uh modular i guess in a way it can adapt more adaptable than google is right now but also you're going to get wrong answers sometimes too it's not like a 100% guarantee type of thing. Yeah. I, that's a good explanation of it. The, the, to your point about like people, you used Google to help you find examples that were similar mm -hmm. um, or help you find page numbers that were similar um, from your textbook or another textbook uh, online to help you answer your questions. Um, but you can use this tool to break down basically um, these complex tests that you require hours and hours and hours of training for or classroom learning to have hands-on answers, I guess. I don't know if that's the right, the right way to explain it, but like anyone has access to this um, or used to have access to it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but does this mean anybody can do any job that? <laughs> no, no, I I don't think so. I mean, minus doctors, minus doctors. Yeah, but even business. Uh, I mean, I'm not an MBA, and I don't really know much about. But I think every single skill is like, yeah, you build this like foundational knowledge, and let's just say Google and ChatGPT have every amount of uh, foundational knowledge uh readily available to you uh foundational knowledge is not like foundational understanding <laughs> there's a big difference between the two and uh if you don't have understanding you're not going to be able to apply it once you're in the actual field and, and then the, the most important part is ap actually applicate application and experience you know just because you're the smartest and know how to do every uh math equation for every physics Math equation doesn't mean you can go design a bridge tomorrow if I gave if I told you to, or just because you knew every single part about the heart's anatomy and uh, understood uh, the surgical processes, you wouldn't be able to do it tomorrow if I told you to go do open heart surgery because it's a whole lot different when you get your hands dirty with any job. So, yeah, I don't think anyone could do anything. I mean. Generally, I think anyone could do, most people can do most jobs with actual work and time put in, but no, they couldn't just walk in and have ChatGPT do everything for you. Like I said in the first episode, it's like the ultimate uh, augmenter of abilities. It makes me 10 times a better programmer. I'm a really bad programmer, so, but so it probably brings me up to decent or maybe even good. I don't know about that yet, uh, but there's a, there's another level of knowledge where if you don't actually understand something, you don't even know what questions to ask it. That's the thing. If you don't, if you don't understand, have a basic level of understanding, you don't know what questions to ask and you don't, you won't be able to uh, fully utilize these new AI tools that are just going to keep getting better. And that's why I think this guy made such a basic video that is because he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand other things and how to apply 
uh, this new AI to other job, other fields, which which is fine because it's not like everyone can do every single field. But to me, uh, for what I, what I do in work is is always I try to understand tangential fields to my work to like a basic what I call like a sophomore college majors level. That way I know what questions to ask. <laughs> it's the, it's always like the most important thing for learning is, is just knowing the right questions uh, to look up, to ask, to dig in deeper. Cause I think that's the main limiter to advancing your own understanding and knowledge. Well, I, I mean, asking the right questions is always um, important. It reminds me of um, iRobot. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I, I saw it a long time ago and I, I can picture it in my mind, but I cannot, I mean, it's the one with Will Smith, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and they have a hologram. There's a, the doctor that made the, uh, I just watched it like last week, I think. So, um, again, the doctors on there, like with the hologram and they're like, he's asking questions about the robots. Like, why did the robots kill him or whatever? And he's like, you have to ask the right questions. Like <laughs> asking the right questions is important to um, to learning and to gaining your basic understanding, whether it's AI or um, making your YouTube videos to buy your two hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this guy knew what questions people were going to ask, and that's how he made videos for for those questions. Yeah, man, they, maybe they're surface level and basic, but chat GPT questions of the future. Um, <laughs> I, I, this is kind of we didn't talk about this before, but if people are coding a ton off of Chat GPT, um, how hackable is that kind of stuff? Maybe that's a question for chance. Oh yeah, but... that's a question for chance. See, there's there's a thing I don't understand and and could not even give you close to a close to an answer because I'm not quite well versed enough in programming slash how computers and these servers work. <laughs> What's well, like you ask a uh, chat GBT, how do I code this? Well, the hacker says, well, how do I code this if I work at XYZ company? And then they say, Oh, this is how we told them to do it. And you break in. I don't know how, how close yeah. that is, but um, yeah. it makes you question at least the legitimacy of, uh, cybersecurity, which is <laughs> in general probably a pretty big fallacy. Uh, cybersecurity, yeah. I think, is a pretty big fallacy in general. I mean, um, it, it probably could, you know, bring an entire new wave of of hackers. I guess you know, it's like uh, a lot of most people, most people when they a lot of people want to learn how to program, and most of us give up within the first few weeks because it's hard. I mean, it actually it's really hard to learn initially. And then uh, I think this this uh, these new AI things are going to sort of like take that activation energy of pushing past that first couple months uh, way lower. So so there's going to be a whole new way more people able to cross that barrier and become at least like okay programmers with the use of AI. And it's going to probably be like all these new hackers, kind of like you said, which is scary to think about. Yeah, and I mean. The way that I understand hacking is like the more people that are attempting, the faster you get hacked, kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, if everyone, if your hackers, you know, are, you know, get to level four instead of level one now because of Chat GBT, well, um, maybe cyber, maybe that's something to talk with a chance about too is the fallacy of cybersecurity. Um, yeah. I bet you there's a lot more information that's out there easily hackable that just hasn't been hacked yet hacked i guess it's, yeah it's already hacked the people already have access to it they just haven't like leaked it yet because they don't have an they don't have a need for it yet maybe yeah um i think that's a pretty big um topic actually um this something that's been big on tiktok recently is ai art it's like mm -hmm. i told an ai to make a warrior for every state or made you know um, oh yeah, I saw that. I don't know if you like, and we might have talked about this before. Is that all from ChatGPT? No, uh, it's from either Stable Diffusion or also OpenAI. So OpenAI is the ones who, oh, founded, found or invented ChatGPT. 
and they also invented <clears throat> they also have several other models they have like a uh i think a voice <clears throat> sorry a voice to text model and then they have like a um embeddings model to make like semantic searches and they have the chat gpt and then they also have dolly and dolly is another art generating one so the, i think the main two that people are using are, are dolly and stable diffusion okay and all you do is just type i mean that's what i used on the youtube shorts that i posted for the for this is i just look i just like let's see we talked about one like how chat gpt can teach people how to break into houses or something the work around you yeah, I just typed in oil canvas painting of man teaching woman to how to break into house. And it <laughs> <laughs> generates like five images or or whatever. And I chose the one I like the best. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was just, like I said, off topic a little bit. But because I was learning that ChatGBT can do art stuff. So I was curious mm -hmm. if, if that's where everyone was getting it from. But um... I, 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 I follow a guy who essentially... You know, built off the API, an app off the Dolly. I don't know if it's off the Stable Diffusion API or the Dolly API. And they built an app that <laughs> essentially, like, you would take a picture of yourself and then it would generate an AI avatar of you. And, you know, whatever they, what, what they do essentially, I think, is they'll, it makes like a call to the API and then they have like a prompt that sort of, probably prefaces the picture the user takes of himself, like make a pretty princess uh, anime style avatar of this or something. And, and so a really simple app, <laughs> you give it a nice user interface and, and it blew up. And, and this guy made like $300,000 in the first month from that. <laughs> just, just, you know, no cost on him besides the, what eventually what turns into the API calls, which, I'm sure three hundred thousand dollars paid, well paid for it, but uh, yeah, the, the, there's all these apps and use cases that people are building off the art thing that that are quick quick money makers for them. I don't think they last because it gets out competed really quick, but the art art thing is a uh, is pretty awesome. I mean, I use it pretty often for small stuff like the shorts and TikToks. Well, the the I first saw that kind of stuff with. It was like face swap or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was AI and you could upload a picture of yourself, either past picture or you could take a selfie and it would put you on like actresses or actors and movies oh, yeah. or um, singers like singing on their music video and like would replace your face. And obviously like putting a fat bearded guy on Taylor Swift or Selena Gomez or <laughs> Shakira or something like that is very funny to me. I don't think other people thought it was funny, but it was very funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was like the first I saw of it. And I was like, this is so, and this was what, probably a year ago, two years ago, mm -hmm. when everyone's bored at home, you know, during the shutdown. And I'm thinking facial recognition is going to skyrocket. And I think that's probably always a conspiracy theory when it's like, hey, this is the challenge for Facebook. The government's uh, mm -hmm. asking hey, we need to update our facial recognition. Have everybody upload a selfie for this uh, yeah. trend. And yeah. that's what I always think of. How true is it? I don't really know. But it's it's definitely there. <laughs> yeah, I think it's there, especially if, I mean, I don't think it's for in these like indie makers apps like the guy I was talking about, but, but for like big tech apps, I could definitely see it. I mean, how hard would it be for a government agency to just, scrape all the profile pictures off of off of these things and and with labels uh name labels and everything so they well you can... upload it from your phone so it's gonna be tied to your phone oh your, that's true your phone has a signature you know uh, yeah whether you have a profile on like google or not like say you're like oh i'm anti-google everyone has a profile like mm -hmm. whether it's titled evan um it might be you know user you know 131 you know or whatever 117 um and so it's building one because it's going to sell to you so like everyone has a profile whether you made one or not officially and so yeah. all these other you know your profile on google is going to be tied to your phone so you upload something on your phone it's going to be tied to your google so they can sell to you and or sell that information mm -hmm. to the government you never know yeah um, so do you think apple 
do you trust Apple with uh, uh, their privacy? Um, no. Okay. And I've talked about this off air before. I don't know if you were a part of the conversation. Apple did some pretty shady things, um, and they're still doing some pretty shady things in China. Um, mm-hmm. The so they were like I think a chip manufacturer, not potato chip, but a um, electronic chip, uh, microchip factory, and they got COVID or something happened. I think it was COVID, and they shut down the plant. They wouldn't let anyone leave. Mm-hmm. Well, like these people are like putting out on the internet, hey, China's like trapped us, we're being held hostage, all this stuff. Well, China contacted the Apple uh, department for China and Apple shut down their cell phone and their internet to these people. Well, guess what? Their friends and family came up to the building to like check on them and they were like drop, uh, airdropping videos to them, like to their family that was outside. Well, guess what? Apple shut down air airdrop too. So like, these people are shady. I mean, yeah. I don't trust them in the slightest. Now, do I still use their products? Yes. Is that bad? <laughs> Is it kind of uh, hypocrisy a little bit? Do you trust them more in the U.S. than in China? Do they have? Diff- do they even have different rules, or is it just like a? I mean, obviously, China has different rules. <laughs> well, yeah, China does, but I, but I mean, like Apple. Apple China versus Apple US. Is there a, is there a separation of the entities? I'm, sh- or... I'm sure there is. Yeah. Um, several years ago, so this is quite a few years ago, probably 2017, 2018. Um, a, a there was somebody got murdered. I think this was in California. Somebody got murdered, and the they had information on the phone. Well, Apple like wouldn't allow the FBI or the police department to like backdoor in. Like they wouldn't give them the backdoor key to their this iPhone to get past the the code. And they like had to come back with like a warrant and stuff, which for good measure, I mean, you know, you can't just search mm-hmm. stuff without a without yeah. a warrant um, or without consent. And obviously, the consent couldn't be had because the person had passed away. Um, so then I was like, kind of, I want. There's the the bootlicker, I guess, side of it of like, well, they need to be helping law enforcement. But like, you get into that territory, then they're just going to release everything. Yeah. Um, there has to be some type of uh, stop point. And I was kind of proud of Apple at that point, but obviously, like, more thing, you know, it's evolved since then. And this China thing is absolutely atrocious. Um, mm-hmm. That, you know, abusing people like that so yeah that's that's awful and i mean i guess the only silver lining was it seems like apple is trying to not divest but diversify their manufacturing i think they're they're building some back in the u.s after that whole incident but yeah so you heard of that incident too i did yeah yeah um i don't know it very well but but i i think that they after that they announced some maybe chip manufacturing or just phone manufacturing in the U S or, uh, some other country. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't, it seems like the, there's a big difference between the U S tech companies in versus the China, the, all, the companies operating in the U S versus how they operate in China. I guess they're more, they work closer with the government. Cause I think that's kind of how the Chinese government works i from what i know actual chinese companies like big companies have to have a uh, ccp board member on their on their uh, board so (laughs) or a government member on their board but in the u.s it seems like they have better separation but i guess the twitter files whole thing kind of shows that rather than just outright force the way the chinese government does they the u.s fbi seemed like they were just kind of manipulating in a way were they paying some too i think they might i don't i don't know if they're paying i didn't really read all of this so much reading i think that i think that the whole way they dropped that stuff was a complete fail because it was too it was too much to read and it's boring wikileaks yeah (laughs) (laughs) but i don't i don't know if they paid but it's like 
it's kind of a peddling influence. You know, you know how people, what are the people that call that give money to politician causes? Lobbyists. Order? Lobbyists, yeah, lobbyists. Kind of like how a lobbyist works in a way. Uh, peddling influence, not necess- not not necessarily by money the way a lobbyist does, but kind of by, well, you know, this is this is I'm the FBI and this is what happened, so you need to fix this or else you are a bad person. <laughs> like guilting, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, in those cases, I think they had similar motives, and so it probably wasn't as hard to cohere. Cohere. Yes, yes. So here's somebody true. to uh, yeah. do what they want. They're like, hey this person's bad. You disagree with them too. Mm-hmm. You know, they might be on the fence or might be you know, leaning when we need to stop them. We yeah. both feel the same way. Um, but yeah. I guess it's one really worse than the other, right? <laughs> They're both bad. So <laughs> one's in the background and one's a lot more obvious, I guess. Yes. Was, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say Apple is definitely better in the U S at least on the mm-hmm. surface. Yeah. Um, it's it's a shame that it's like this now, um, but everyone's just trying to gain a competitive edge. Yeah, I uh, mean, a- Apple's a ruthless company. I mean, the whole like App Store thirty percent cut thing is is insanity. Uh, so I, I I I don't know. I wouldn't put it past them to do whatever could benefit <laughs> benefit the company. Uh, well, I was talking to somebody. I think it was at work. There, I guess they had read up some. They say it's actually easier to start an LLC and um, maybe more profitable in China than it is in the United States. Um, that I guess if you are a, we'll say LLC because I don't know what it's called there, but mm-hmm. in a small business, if you earn under a certain threshold of money, you don't pay any taxes, um, especially if you hire like hired people, you don't pay any taxes, you don't have to worry about it. Um but once you get a certain threshold, you start paying taxes and then you also have to have a board and you also have to um, portion a portion of your company is owned by the Chinese government. Yeah. And um, what, which probably like major. I mean, that's what no, you can't know for sure what limits them compared to the U.S. And why, why are there so many more, you know, crazy startups here than there? But I think that's the big one is is entrepreneurs like thrive in freedom and it's not a super free maybe it's easier to start an LLC it's not hard to start one here you pay 80, oh, no. 88 bucks and and you have one <laughs> like, awesome paperwork yeah yeah uh so i don't know what what it is there i guess they don't pay 88 dollars so they must be able to do it for basically free but it's... yeah and i think the big thing was like they're not paying taxes for mm-hmm. you know if they earn under a certain income yeah um but yeah, you do have the degree of freedom here for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. That was just somebody I was talking at work about. They were like, "Oh yeah, uh, China is a little bit easier to you know you don't pay taxes and stuff for mm-hmm. your small business." Um. I mean, I'd much rather have freedom than um <laughs> and pay taxes on my LLC than yeah. to be in China. Um, yeah. <laughs> To go back a little bit to Chat GBT, it recently became paid, right? Is uh, yeah, it has like the it has a paid and free version. So the free version is still the exact same as what you had, but the paid version, which is forty two dollars a month, which is kind of outrageous. Uh, <laughs> I guess I guess if you're really good at Chat GPT and know how to use it really well, then it's definitely worth forty two dollars a month. But uh, for most people. The free version is is better. I mean, but so the paid version is essentially you have access to it at any time, even during high demand uh, times, and the responses are way faster. And then to me, the most valuable asset in it is the fact that supposedly these people get first dibs on new features and new updates. So which to me sounds like they'll get first dibs on GPT-4. (laughs) <laughs> which which would kind of make it completely worth it to me, but maybe when GPT four comes out, I'll just pay the forty two dollars a month then. But the free version now, since they went paid on a couple days ago, the free version is now, um, like I said, the exact same. But during high traffic times, it just turns off. You it sends you like a message like we're experiencing high traffic. Come back later if you want us to tell 
to email you when it's when it's back up or you're ready for to run, then uh, let us know. Check this box. And uh, I didn't. I wasn't able to access it on the weekend. Uh, I'll say that. So it was always full on the weekends. But during work today, I was able to access it. I use it quite a bit for work. It's like to me, it's a incredible supplement to reading a paper and you don't really know what some something is and instead of googling and having to search for it i just type in a question and it seems to answer it pretty well but yeah the the paid version now 42 dollars a month versus uh, so you get the speed and new features but to me probably not worth it yeah i wonder i guess they control of what is considered peak um Oh, definitely. I think it was costing them six million dollars a day right now. So, wow, that's a lot of processing them. power. I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but hey, I mean, I'd pay the forty-two dollars a a month for it if I had a, you know, business, you know, MBA uh, exam or something like that <laughs> that I need oh, help on. <laughs> yeah, you need some help. You need some help. It's <laughs> a lot. That's e- a lot cheaper than Chegg. So, <laughs> an open notes, an open notes uh, test. Yeah. Um. Did you have any more you want to talk about with that stuff? I mean, we t- we covered quite a bit there, but no, I think I, yeah, I think okay. I hit everything. Um, let's transition into Mark Cuban. I sent you a video this morning. We were like, "Hey, let's what is something to talk about?" And of course, Twitter comes to my rescue. Maybe it was TikTok comes to my rescue and sends me a video that I'm like, "Hey, this would be interesting to talk about." Mark Cuban um, started a pharmacy, I guess, pharmaceutical company. It's called costplusdrugs.com. Yeah. And basically, they get these drugs at their market value, their manufactured value, um, with all their discounts and everything. And then they add, I think it's 15% plus shipping, which for a lot of your drugs, and they don't do any marketing. All their marketing is from word of mouth. Um, they don't spend any any amount of money on marketing. So it's, you know, Mark Cuban or tweeting about it, that this website's live. And it, I personally looked up all the, um, narcotics is not the right word, is it? Uh, drugs, um, supplements that I take, I looked them up on there and they were, although very cheap, wasn't cheaper for me just because of insurance. Um, now granted you could argue, well, don't buy insurance, but you know, if you go to the doctor somewhat regularly, it's worth it. Um, oh yeah. I just, I just got a physical, <laughs> I got a physical, so I was in between insurance, uh, when I switched jobs and I had a physical, um, I'm very smart, I guess. And my insurance had to start it up for my new company and ended at my last company. And I had had to pay like $300 for a physical. So That's yay so to me. Dumb. Um, Luckily, I have good or been putting away money for uh, what's it called? HSA. So, HSA, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is fantastic. If you have that option, look that up. Uh, especially if your company gives you money. My last company is still paying me money um, in my HSA for um, because they owe me for the year. They pay oh, X wow. amount of dollars per year. So they're still yeah. putting money in. It's not much, but they're still putting money in. So, yeah, um, that's nice. Um, and I, you know, even though I am overweight, I don't have a ton of medical expenses. So when it hits a thousand dollars, you can invest it. And then at 65, if there's any money left over that you didn't spend, guess what? You get to pull it out tax free. So there's a lot of benefits to it. If you can get an HSA, it's so beneficial. Um, versus a, what is a health flex account? I think is what it's called. Those are terrible. Um, which is where you put X amount of dollars in and you lose it at the end of the year if you don't use it. So yeah, that sucks. That's ridiculous. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about cost plus drugs. Um, how I, I've heard it. I heard of it a couple months ago, but it's been just, out for a little while. For I don't know if it's been out for a year, but it's been out for a little while. And it's kind of funny that you sent it this morning because I was looking at the site yesterday, looking at the drugs. So. One thing, I, I don't know if you said this, but it's for generic drugs only. So oh, okay. uh, you weren't going to find every drug on there, but essentially generics are like 
the same molecular form formulation, but not the brand, uh, the brand name. And they can only you can only have generics. Uh, I think it's like six or seven years after uh, approval of the original drug. So you know FDA guarantees exclusivity for new drugs for a certain time frame, and then generics can be uh, sent to market if they pass their own trials to make sure that it's the you know right stuff <laughs> so yeah it's like a generics generics drug uh manufacturer and i think they yeah they have like 800 i mean they have a, most of the i mean the majority of drugs are are gonna be uh have a generic version so it does seem like it's it could save people a lot of money but for some people like yourself that insurance will cover um it's it's uh not necessarily that much of a benefit, but it, I could see it becoming a real benefit in a few years when GLP-1 agonists become, start having generics come out because insurances aren't going to approve for, generally aren't going to approve your prescription or, or are not going to want to pay for off-label prescriptions. So if you are, I don't know if the FDA ever approved GLP-1 agonists for weight loss. Let's just assume not. So if you get prescribed GLP-1 or semaglutide or trisepatide for weight loss, they uh, uh, your insurance is probably not going to cover it. So, th so this is where somewhere something like this could come in and cost 20, 30 bucks a month rather than a thousand, twelve hundred dollars a month. <laughs> so it's definitely an awesome, awesome company. And I don't know why no one built it until now. It's like quite simple. <laughs> Well, I mean, competition, I mean, we live in a free market. Competition mm -hmm. is what drives this. I mean, it's going to force, I say force. It might not have to because of people like me where they get insurance and it pays for it, um, the negotiated price that they agree on. Um, but I think it's going to it's gonna force them to at least lower it some because um, people are going to start doing math on, okay, why well, pay – a hundred dollars a month for health insurance and I buy these drugs. Well, if I only go to the doctor once a year, you know, is it really worth it? Um, mm -hmm. So like there's, I mean, those, those types of like scenarios that it's going to be beneficial for uh, a ton. Um, and it's also like if you're a high risk patient maybe, and you can't get insurance or, um, you know, really nice insurance, then, um, you know, this is an option. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how insurance works for like Medicare and Medicaid. Um, as far as like prescriptions go, I don't know if that's included. I, I think it'll cover it a lot. Covers. A lot. I, okay, I, I think so. At least for most generics, I don't know. I don't know insurance very well. Um, but like you said, it's it should hopefully help the competition and bring down prices. But gosh, the like whole healthcare system is in this ridiculous stranglehold where every single company, and this is not just on drugs, this is also on hospitals. They all Procedures. act as their own monopoly, essentially. Every single one is like a local, a sort of local monopoly in a way where they can price whatever they want. And because of the insurances, uh, because everyone, most people have insurance, they can say oh this is a thirty thousand dollar procedure when it's not at all and it doesn't matter it's kind of like car like like if car insurance covered oil changes do you think an oil change would be fifty dollars it'd be no it'd be like five hundred dollars <laughs> and so i think that's kind of what's happened with with the whole insurance insurance healthcare insurance ridiculousness uh, it's nice that something like this is actually going to try to compete away some of that and can probably help a lot of people. I mean, the the more research that's being done, the more we see like how uh, how do I, what's the right word for this? How drugs can have different effects and po and be positive in different diseases than they were initially tested or approved for. And it costs so freaking much money to go through a clinical trial again to see if it. Uh, uh it, it takes it costs so much money to figure out if the drug can be used for another indication that it's just not really worth it and so um insurances aren't going to cover it aren't going to cover most things for off-label use 
So this is where something where off-label use for a generic can come into play. And, you know, you could find something like uh, maybe in the future, um, SCLT2 inhibitors for, which are used for heart failure, <clears throat> but aren't approved in like congenital heart disease because it's a different ideology, but it kind of makes sense. What if you have a congenital heart disease, then maybe an SGLT2 inhibitor would help you. And perhaps just because no one's doing a trial on it, maybe uh, insurance won't cover that for you. So this is where something like that could step in and be really cheap for someone to um, uh, buy the drug and take the drug for kind of off-label use that makes logical sense, you know, with your own healthcare provider. Um, so I, circling back to generics aren't available for seven years after it's been, the drug has been initially tested and released. Mm -hmm. Is that to, I guess, protect the company of like, okay, what well, costs so much to put a drug through trial and you do all the research and, you know, discover its uses. And well, you spent all this money. You're not allowed to reverse engineer it until seven years or at least yep. post your reverse engineering for seven years. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly why. Cause it costs an, an, an insane amount to go through the FDA. Like I think like the, well, well, a lot of these scales are skewed are a little bit skewed. Like generally you'll see that it costs a billion dollars to get a drug from the lab bench to the market. And I think that's a little bit high because, because it's factoring in a lot of other things that the companies don't usually pay for, like basic research. I think uh, that ends up getting taken bought out by a company and then taken into trial. But I think you're going to be costing around hundred million dollars to go through fit all the way through phase three and get approval. And that's a, that's a ton of money, especially for small companies and the larger, the lower, the, the sort of the lower the effect size. So like the lower the effect of a drug, like impact, the more patients you're going to have to bring in for the trial to get, to see whether or not it works because of, and that ends up costing more and more money. And then there's also the manufacturing process that costs a lot of money building. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you know who Robert Reich is on Twitter. Mm -mm. I meant to actually include this in the, in the topics. Uh, this is very relevant to this, this idea as he tweeted this week. Oh, the Moderna vaccine is going to cost like a hundred dollars or something. So the COVID vaccine or whatever is going to cost a hundred dollars. They cost them two eighteen to manufacture. This is an outrage. This is evil capitalism. And, you know, that I, uh, to preface this, the COVID vaccine is a little bit of a rare case because they got so much government funding that it's a little bit different. But let's just leave that out at the moment. But $2.18 to manufacture is not the real cost of manufacturing. You know, the fact that you've built out, that's not, that's like how much the raw materials cost, but how much did the, did the manufacturing plant cost? How much does the work, do the workers cost? How much did the research before cost? Those things all get factored into drugs, which leads to the kind of insane pricing that we see. Yeah, I mean, and that makes that, perfect sense. But yeah, and, and that to say, there's actually some like really uh, uh, kind of evil pricing in some drugs. But I think for the most part, it's pretty, pretty fair. <laughs> Yeah, I think those like, I mean, the cost has to come from somewhere. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like to to give benefit of the doubt to the manufacturers. It's not just like, well, you know, this drug could save somebody's life. Let's make it a thousand dollars. I don't. I don't think they just pull a number out of the hat. Like they have a big hat and has different yeah. price tags on. They just pull one out and says, "Oh, this one's fifty dollars." Okay, this one, you know, they don't. They yeah. don't do that. Um, <laughs> Now, granted, they might add a little for, few more percentage points on it. Um, uh, they they add big multiples. It is a, it is a sketchy. Since uh, some of it is is uh, a little bit um, monopolistic and dangerous in a, in a way, especially especially like once there is a generic available and all the all of them kind of collude together and still keep their their prices extremely high. It's like quite sketchy but when we're talking about like rare disease drugs that that cost a, an absolute fortune i think it's actually 
pretty fair because the, the research and the amount of patients is pretty low. So it's on the insurance to cover those sort of rare things. Well, and uh, in the Mark Cuban video, which I'll try and link down below in the description, um, he talked about, I think it was a leukemia pill. Mm -hmm. um, it was like a month supply. And it was like, I think it was like $2,000 if you were buying on the open market. And with insurance, it's nine hundred dollars. What? And he's saying you they sell it for like sixty five bucks. I don't know the exact numbers, but it was about mm -hmm. like those are kind of the on the market value was extremely high. Yeah. The insurance negotiated cost was you know was high but not like astronomical. And then like the actual manufacturing cost that he's selling it for is is super low, like less than a hundred bucks. Yeah, that's and, crazy. I mean. And that's something that obviously, because he's selling it, there's a generic for. Mm -hmm. So maybe this brand, I don't know if there's a really good way to justify something like that. Um, no, no. But I think a company like this, this Cost Plus Drugs, 100% benefits uh, the consumer in, in those yes. cases for sure. Yes, this is like a pure, like an actual capitalistic form of healthcare. You know, people say that that the healthcare system being capitalistic is what causes this whole conundrum that we have but i actually think it's it's yeah it's ruthless cap it's like crony capitalism it's not real capitalism because they've they've moved the goalpost to where no one can play except for them so they can price whatever they want but now with companies like this this changes ev this changes everything like you said it's like it's like real capitalism and competition, market competition to level the playing field for everyone. And hopefully, hopefully, like you said, it's a major benefit to the consumer. Um, well, to your point that they're all colluding together, I don't, I don't know what, what type of capitalism do you say it was? Crony capitalism. Crony capitalism. So yeah. in, in that case, you know, I'm not much of a government person stepping in like the government, you know, usually when they step in, they screw things up. Mm -hmm. One of the most, the founding principle of government is to protect the people from corporations. Um, and that's like one of the reasons why there's all these government agencies, but they're not doing their job if they're not protecting us from this type of capitalistic society. Um, yeah. At least, and I don't know how prevalent that is in, you know, elsewhere, um, maybe not as predominant as it is in the medical field, but um, the government should probably step in and say like, Hey, like you can't do this. And yeah. I mean, I think they did do that with insulin. If I'm not wrong, if I'm correct, Maybe the insulin thing is actually kind of like a bit of a fictionalized, Fallacy. well, it's like a fictionalized, uh, or dramatized tale is, you know, they show the insulin costs in the U S and they're astronomical. They're crazy, uh, versus other countries. But the truth is, that those you can you can get insulin really cheap uh in here in the u.s uh it's the new forms like the pro pro drug forms that are a little bit better that are really expensive and i don't and i mean I, it's it's a little bit of a frustration to me to always see that story because you know you could make people can make insulin really cheap and no one has just stepped in and do, done it. Or maybe they have, and I'm just not aware of it. And it just is not enough of a news story to, to uh, make headlines. <laughs> so, I mean, this, this ex ex essentially is exactly what cost plus drugs could do is produce insulin for cheap because it's not, it's, it's not on patent. It's off patent. Uh, just the insulin that is really expensive is the newest, more advanced form that, they have sort of genetically modified, I guess, in some way. Um, I, I might be saying this a little bit wrong, but it's a new, newer modified form of insulin that's a little bit better acting more in effective. some way. More effective, yeah. That's what costs so much. And if someone wanted to make insulin right now... If, it, if someone wanted to make insulin right now, it was... They could do it for like $10 a month and and uh, sell it easy. Like cost plus drugs, exact same style. And I'm guessing someone's already done that. It's just... Like I said, not a headline maker. Yeah. I'm surprised things like that aren't set up like a subscription. I guess with pharmacies, it is kind of a subscription-based. Um, yeah, yeah, true. 
Um, you save 2% if you subscribe. Um, <laughs> one thing that I kind of want to end on that, and it was this transparency bill for hospitals. Huh. I don't know. Whatever became of that, I was looking it up and it supposedly went into effect in 2021. Um, but I don't know how, like, I haven't seen anything. My yeah, dad was just either. in the hospital not too long ago, and I didn't see any menu on there of saying what things cost, <laughs> um, which is what I was totally expecting. But um, my dad's fine if you're curious. Um, Good. But yeah, it says starting, this is from cms.gov. Uh, starting January 1st, 2021, each hospital operating in the United States will be required to provide a clear, accessible pricing information online about the items and services they provide in two ways. As a comprehensive machine-readable file with all items and services, two, and a display of shoppable services in a consumer-friendly format. So maybe you got to go in and request it. Um, mm. Probably. Yeah, it's just, yeah, there's probably some loopholes that they got around. Yeah, Hospitals maybe it's like... Gross nonprofits can not do it or you know don't have yeah. to or something like that. oh that's probably what it is honestly wouldn't be surprised but um i'll have to dig into more of i didn't know if you yeah. knew anything about it um i just know no. like when it first was talked about you and i and some of the other guys were talking about how like this could really save people a bunch of money yeah because um, i mean it's expensive to go to the hospital it's expensive to go to the er um especially you know I say especially, you know, like elective surgeries and stuff like that, or, you know, mm -hmm. um, non-elective, I guess is the correct term. But, um, I mean, it could really save people a bunch of money. So to see that nothing's really come of it if it really did start two years ago um, in, in effect. So I don't know. Yeah, it's it should have helped. <laughs> to me, the whole healthcare system is broken by the insurance model. It's like, well, Insurance is for cat catastrophe. It shouldn't be for, you know, basic di diagnostics and checkups. You call it, I call it the oil change. Like your, your basic checkups shouldn't be covered by insurance. And the fact that it is covered by insurance makes the price astronomical. And then, so if the price is astronomical for a basic checkup, then the price for a uh, surgery has, uh, but I mean, that's what insurance should be for. It should be for emergencies and, and, when it's not, that's what causes all this corruption in the whole system. That insurances don't don't pay sixty thousand dollars for your surgery that you see on your your hospital bill. They don't. They just simply don't pay that. That's a lie. Uh, they negotiate it down, and most of them have deals with the hospitals. But if you if if people could see how much they were paying and could and could uh, and insurance didn't cover your basic checkup, then your basic checkup would cost like thirty bucks. I guarantee it. It would be, you know, you're in and out within 15 minutes, $30. That's that's it. You're our patient. If you want to do some blood work, all right, that's $60 uh, rather than $600 on the insurance. And say you end up paying $60 out of pocket anyways so most of the time. So I that's my whole stance on health insurance and the whole system. And the price transparency bill is like, it would have helped a lot, but I think nothing would help more than than changing the insurance system. But unfortunately, it's too late. It's like, oh, I don't even know how you could could change it. You have to build a whole new system to for people to opt into. That's the only way. You can't, I don't think we could ever top down, you know, strip it and restart it. I think it just has to be a, a parallel system has to be built that it, people slowly opt into. And I don't really know how that's going to look or how how who's going to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not for sure, and you definitely couldn't just like collapse one one system and start the other. It'd have you'd have to do it yeah. side by side. But with the amount of money that's in the, those fields, the other one's going to get trashed by people, and it would just it would be hard for it to see the light of day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, I'm pretty sure like the biggest lobbying uh, uh, industry is is healthcare. healthcare they they say it's the guns, but it's uh, <laughs> I don't know if I believe that. <laughs> I don't know what they actually say, but um, I know that's the one that's always attacked the most is yeah. is the the firearm industry and yeah. firearm lobbying, which, yeah, there's some bills for that kind of, uh, that's a completely different topic, but there's some bills that got introduced recently that um, we'll see. 
topic for another day. Yeah, if I can articulate it. <laughs> That's something I struggle with. So, um, you have any hot takes or anything you want to readdress? Uh, oh, oh, semi hot take. Not a really hot take, but uh, I think Google comes out with a ChatGPT variant within the next two months. And I think it's going to be free. Free. I think it will be free at first, but I think it's going to be pretty mind blowing. I think it'll make ChatGPT look like a like an amateur. Yeah, I can see it. I could see that happening. I don't know about two months, but um... I've been thinking they've had one for a long time, and have just been withholding it because they're making their money. They got. They're still. Their business model stands is standing strong. Like ChatGPT is just the newest the only threat that they've ever had. And I think, you know, to neutralize the threat, they'll release their bigger guns. Not duck, duck go or whatever it was called. <laughs> um, okay. Well, if you don't have anything else, you? Do you have a hot take? Um, I don't think so. I think everything that was said has been pretty, pretty mild, but also on point. Like, I don't think, I don't think I have anything. No. Um, I'll buy a car maybe in the next six months. <laughs> yeah, the car market is changing finally. Yeah, Teslas, man. I should have bought a Tesla. Oh, I know. They. <laughs> uh, so I, was, I follow a guy on Twitter, and he said that the CarMax had like 700 or 800 Teslas. They dropped their price by what was it, like twelve k or something like that, fifteen k, wow. and they sold like seventy percent of their stock in twenty four hours. Wow! Um, well, after awesome. that drop, so um, it wasn't me. I didn't buy any of them. But is this the used car sales guy on Twitter? Yeah, yeah. Does yeah. Matt talk to you about that? Yeah, <laughs> I, don't I know he hasn't talked to me about that. Oh, I've just seen it. <laughs> it's like the guy, the guy mafia. I heard on a podcast. It's uh, on my first million. I heard these guys. They're like pseudonymous Twitter accounts that are like the expert uh, car salesman. You find the watch guy, you'll find the jewelry guy. And, and like they make so much money because all these people like trust them as the number one source because they are a good source of information. And then they're like, hey, man, I, I'd love to buy a car from you. Like, <laughs> I don't do think I'm going to get screwed. Let me buy it from you. Yeah, yeah. And then you, you know, hopefully they don't like absolutely screw people on that, but. <laughs> um, I that's the biggest thing of being a salesperson. This is this is not my hot take. This is genuine advice. All you have to do is make the customer feel like they won. Yeah, that's all you do. They will come <laughs> back and buy from you end to end. I remember I was trying to buy a car from this this place, and they had uh, it was like a Toyota Camry, and it was fine, and it was it was like slightly overpriced by a couple thousand dollars. And I was like, hey, I'll I'll buy this car from you for I think it was like listed at 14. I was like, I'll buy it from you for 12. Um, and I'll even finance through you guys if you want. And they said, no, we want it for this price. Didn't move a dollar. Didn't move a dollar. I was like, you guys not gonna negotiate? No. That car sat on that lot for four months. I went back to them and talked to them multiple times. And I was like, hey, your car, that car's still here. I'll buy it. You know, I'll I'll buy it right now. Like we can sign the paper right now. Nope, didn't move. And it finally sold, but like it was just and who knows what they sold it for. There's just the ego, probably. Oh yeah. Um but like just make them just even if they had moved like a thousand dollars and like met me halfway, like is if you can make me feel like I won, then I will come back. I will talk about how oh these guys gave me such a great deal, like just the marketing mm -hmm. and stuff from that. Um I I remember seeing it all the time at Lowe's. I, I worked at Lowe's a little bit in college and those big box stores like that are a complete scam um, as far as like their prices. I know that they Lowe's and Home Depot will mark up their items like 250%. Holy crap. And you think you're getting a deal when they mark it like it's the end of seasonal and they'll mark something down <laughs> to 70% uh, off. Well, guess what? They're still making over 100% profit on this. They can buy 10 yeah. more or, you know, another one. And, um, now they're not making like what they want, but I mean, and so when you buy something like a dude, look, I got this at Lowe's. Look, Lowe's is such a good place. I got this for 70% off. You yes. tell everybody, oh, I'm going to go buy some stuff at Lowe's. 
guess what? They still made so much money. So yep. I guess that's my hot take. Yeah. Those places are scams. <laughs> <laughs> but they do a good job of making you feel like they do. You you won. Like, oh, I got 70% off. Yeah. And I mean, I remember once uh I was looking for a washer dryer when I bought this house. And I know I'm rambling, but um I was looking to buy a washer dryer and I went to Lowe's to just look, just to look and see what they had and uh get prices so I know I wasn't getting screwed on Facebook Marketplace or something like that. They had a washer dryer set that like one of them had a dent in it and they had to sell it as a set. And it was this somebody bought it for $125. They're selling for like twelve hundred dollars. Oh, they had because yeah. they had a dent. Somebody's like, I'll take it for $125. I was like, well, oh. that should have been me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they walked out with it. It's like a life hack right there. Find the broken, the dented ones. Oh, or dent your own. Yeah. Dang. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> don't, I'm not, I'm not advocating for that. I'll say that. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can get something damaged, yeah. Lowe's 10% off. Any employee can give you 10% off. Um, if you can come up with, oh, the box is marked up. And if I have to return it, it's going to look like I damaged it. Can I get 10% off? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, Anyone can give you 10% off. But anyways, I've been rambling. Uh, do you have any comments on that stuff? Nope. I think uh, okay. pretty much hit it. <laughs> uh, well, this has been Simply Technical. Thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe, comment down below that um, you watch the full thing and you love our hosting and topics. But we'll catch you next time.